All right, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning and happy Father's Day. Do we have any dads in the audience today? Yes, several. <laughs> uh, happy Father's Day to Brad and Will. This is their first Father's Day. Hopefully they're home enjoying it. Um, happy almost Father's Day to Bob and other expectant dads out there. Home enjoying that too. Uh, I know Jamie's about ready to burst. Uh, how many dads here have little girls? Or girls in general? Girls. Girls. Girls or grown women? Almost grown women. Okay. All right. You got both. Awesome. All right, so um, fathers often discount the importance of their relationships with daughters. It is common for fathers to believe that the mother is the most influential role when really fathers really do have an equally important role in their daughters' lives. Mothers are important, but fathers offer specific things to their young daughters that mothers cannot provide. Dads have a role in daughters' self-esteem, which influence education, ethical behavior, sexual maturity, and a young girl's entrance into abusive or non-abusive relationships, assuming that father is not abusive himself. This is not to discount the role of the mother, again, uh, or to say that correlation is causation, but there is ample enough data to suggest that dads shouldn't think that inseminating a woman, going to work, paying the bills, and visitation every other weekend constitutes the extent of fatherhood. We can do just as much damage in raising a child as a mother can, uh, but we can have significantly positive impact on our young women's lives. So that's our role as fathers, support our daughter's dreams, break down barriers, protect and be role models. But what about their roles in society? We can only influence so much. The demands of our future women are daunting, and the influences of pop culture and media can be overwhelming. They get mixed messages. Jamie Lee Curtis once stated that there's nothing but media telling us we're all supposed to be great cooks, have great style, be great in bed, be the best mothers, speak seven languages, and be able to understand derivatives. And we don't really have women we're modeling after. So we're all looking for how to do this. Pop uh, R&B icon Beyonce Knowles has a song out recently it's called Girls Run the World. Girl, girls run the world. Yet we have men in government trying to legislate what women can and cannot do with their bodies. The world literacy rate for women, well beyond that of their male counterparts. And of course, uh, economically, black women are the most, or are the poorest segment in the nation. And yet we hear girls run the world. Mixed message. So what are our young ladies to do? How do we as fathers help them succeed? Do we take the cultural or religious cues of hiding them behind religious cloaks and threats of the dagger should they succumb? I don't have the answer. The demands keep piling up. Will our daughters be strong enough? As fathers, we can only hope to build up our daughters confident enough, strong enough, to take on that challenge themselves. The future belongs to them. I may be a little biased in saying this, but as free-thinking women and future skeptics, they already, have, they already understand how to buck the system and may have a good head start. Uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage in 1890 wrote, in order to help preserve the very life of the Republic, it is imperative that women should unite upon a platform of opposition to the teaching and aim of, every, uh, of the ever most unscrupulous enemy of freedom. The church. With that, I say welcome. We have a little bit of a, a change from our typical, um, typical um, format. We only have one major speaker today, and that is going to be uh, Dr. Matthew Brown, and he's going to be covering uh, women and science. Uh, and so we'll be welcome, welcoming him uh, up to the stage shortly. Uh, but before that, if we can have the faithless companions up. Um, there's a, uh, you guys ready? There's at least one companion. There's only one companion here? <laughs> uh, and as they set, as they set up, um, as he sets up, um, I would be remiss in uh, not acknowledging um, that we did have a death in our Free Thought family just uh, not too long ago. Um, 
Kumar, Pranoid Kumar Prada and passed away um, this past Tuesday, June 7th. So Zach will be uh, talking about that in memoriam a little bit later on. But with that, uh, I covered that last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he, yeah. To uh, to really busy schedule, so we just kind of jumped on this and put together a couple of things for you here, just uh, at the last minute. Uh, and uh, I was uh, thinking about our uh, departed free thinker, and so put together a couple of songs that I thought were appropriate. <laughs> the last my son blunders down to darkness the bright shout of air will freeze to silence on the bone the blood strict latitude will be undone and I'll wash out through the easy music of my skin as I once came in of what remains take care what I had a loveliness of nerves it whispered me into strains of the blue world and I found myself there is no everywhere each small life curves to its own spirit holding the known like a bird or stone water was my element my law motion When tides plucked at me, I sailed. There are no maps of that lost region behind the eyes. The moon where my wake band printed the sea with fire of dark loam guided me home remember then when all my fury lies in a heap of scars how I lived keep me from the shattering kiss of fire and the immemorial worm's soft call sweet one speak low and commend my body to the deep that I may Brown, who's going to be talking about Wonder Woman and science.
Okay, well, uh, thanks so much for having me today. Um, when Justin Fisher asked me to come uh, give this talk here, I thought it's a kind of strange uh, talk for this venue, and uh, only today did I realize, well, it's because it's Father's Day that he wants me to come talk about Wonder Woman. Um, uh, for those of you who, who, who don't know, Wonder Woman um, is a fatherless creature created out of the clay by her mother, lives on an island of immortal Amazon women where no men are allowed. So, of course, it's the perfect talk for <laughs> Father's Day. Um, uh, okay, well, um, my topic is Wonder Woman, Science, Values, and Popular Culture. Um, my name is Matthew Brown, and I am the director of the Center for Values in Medicine, Science, and Technology at the University of Texas at Dallas. I'll plug that center um, uh, when I'm done again, because uh, uh, I think it, it's something that would be of interest to many of you. Make sure this works. Um, okay, well, who here is a Wonder Woman fan? Anybody uh, a fan of Wonder Woman? Okay. <laughs> And now, who of you know Wonder Woman primarily from the television show, the 70s Linda Carter classic? Right? And who, are there any comic book readers who know Wonder Woman that way? Excellent, excellent. Okay. Now, has anybody ever looked at some of the original 1940s stories about Wonder Woman? Yeah? A few? Yeah? You were there, right? <laughs> right on. Okay. Well, that's, that's where we're going to start. Um, uh, Wonder Woman... Uh, was a very early figure in comics history, created in 1941, only uh, three years or so after Superman, who's of course the original superhero. Um, and she quickly became extremely popular, one of the most popular characters in comics, such that by summer of 1942, six months after she, was, she started publication, she had three separate comic books she was being published in. Um, uh, monthly periodicals, or actually one of them was quarterly. Um, her creator, uh, accredited uh, as Charles Moulton, um, actually the pen name of William Moulton Marston, um, is a super interesting figure, and he's going to take up a lot of the talk today. Um, and in a way, so this makes it Father's Day appropriate because Marston is the father of Wonder Woman in, in the literary sense. To give you a sense of um, what's interesting to talk about in the early Wonder Woman comics. I'm going to go through a few examples. I'll start with this two-page spread from Wonder Woman number four, April, May, 1943, uh, a little story called The Rubber Barons, about an evil plot involving rubber and Nazis, um, as was common in the 40s, the comic book characters. Um, uh, so I'm just going to, re I'll read through this story with you. Um, so Wonder Woman here is with Elva Torgson, who is, a, or not, not, not Elva Torgson, Elva, I forget her last name. She's a reformed criminal um, who, uh, and they're going to engage in reforming her love interest, Ivar Torgson. Um, what Wonder Woman is showing her here is an x-ray photograph of Torgson's subconscious. Uh, which is a technology only the Amazons possess. Um, and uh, it's hard to make out the detail, but essentially uh, uh, Torxen is acting like a king, and she's, he's treating Alva as, as his slave, and that's very, uh, that's not cool. So, so she says, that's the way Ivar thinks of me. I can't believe it. And Wonder Woman says, most men secretly think of women that way in this man-ruled world, but I have an idea. We can, we can uh, cure Ivo, Ivar if you'll help. So they, be, they begin an experiment to reform him. Um, here, I'll, I'll put this costume on you. You must make him think of you as his queen in his subconscious instead of his slave. Uh, then you must learn to control him. <laughs> you can do that by dressing like a queen and acting the part. And with my magic lasso, Ivar will submit to your wishes. He'll love it. When he he's learned to enjoy being your captive, you can control him without any lasso. And I, uh, Elva somewhat suspiciously says, wonderful, if it works. Okay. Um, so they begin. They've got Ivar here, this mus muscle-bound man, tied up with the magic lasso. Um, uh, Queen Elva, I give you this slave. Subdue him. These secret subterranean rooms are completely furnished for your use, including a cell for your captive. 
In three days I will return, adieu. This is read by children in the 1940s. Um, so at first he rebels bitterly, of course. It's, it's uh, ridiculous, right? He's, you're making a, a fool of me. And she says, I'm making a man of you. Learning to submit is the final test of manhood. Um, and Ivar discovers to his amazement that he enjoys being the girl's captive. She taunts him with the uh, keys, and he thinks to himself, I don't want to take the keys. I can't. Okay, so she puts him away in the cell for the night. Um, I'm bored with you into your cell. Oh, please keep me with you, she says. Um, now, uh, on the second day, she removes the lasso, and he remains uh, subdued, right? He says, so long as you keep me your slave, I'll always submit. And he starts following her around and annoying her. Um, <laughs> As the third day draws to a close, Elva accepts Ivar's ardent marriage proposal. Oh, my beautiful queen, marry me. Please marry me. Oh, if you insist, but you'll still be my slave. <laughs> Suddenly, a flood of prehistoric feminine feelings overwhelms Elva's untrained mind. Um, and she thinks, oh, the chains have to be uncomfortable. I'll have to release him. Um, and he's, he's like, no, no, don't release me. Ah. As Elva submits to Ivar's domination, his male conceit instantly returns. You fool, you should have kept me bound. You had me going, but you're a weak sister, like all women. But Ivar, I don't understand. Um, and then Wonder Woman comes knocking at the door, and he pushes her off to the side, grabs the magic lasso, and as you can imagine, all kinds of mischief ensues from here on out. Um, this, is, this may seem like a really strange moment, but this is all over. The, this, this kind of stuff is all over these early Wonder Woman comics. You see things like Wonder Woman thinking to herself, well, if girls want to be slaves, there's no harm in that. The bad thing is for them to submit to a master or to an evil mistress like Paula. A good mistress could do wonders with them. You see, especially when, they're, when Wonder Woman visits her Amazon sisters back on Paradise Island, they're constantly engaged in tying one, other, one another up, chaining one another up, um, uh, there's, I, I was looking for a copy of it this morning, I couldn't find it, but there's a great memo between the, the, this author and the editor of DC Comics about um, different ways we could have Wonder Woman tying, peach, uh, tying people up and being tied up so that we didn't have to have chains all the time. Because, um, uh, you know, the censors were worried about the chains. So they were, they were trying to get the chains down 50%. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, I'm going to try to explain this as um, more than a kind of bizarre fetishism uh, on the part of the author. Um, and, and in order to do so, we have to talk a bit about who this fellow was. William Moulton Marston was a trained psychologist from Harvard. He got his PhD in, um, I believe, 1917. He comes from the lineage of William James and Wilhelm Wundt, the fathers of European and American psychology, um, European and American psychology, um, by way of Hugo Munsterberg, who is the, the person William James brought in as his replacement in the Harvard Psychology Laboratory. Um, and uh, Marston, he was widely published in all of the major psychology journals of his day. He held appointments at a variety of universities. Um, Columbia was one. Uh, uh, hard pressed to think of the others. Um, University of Southern California was another. Um, he was also, uh, his, his main interests were in emotions and in forensic psychology. He was a um, major developer and proponent of what became the polygraph lie detector test. He, had, he developed a theory of the emotions, a theory of consciousness, and, a, and various works in abnormal psychology. Um, his work was, he's, he's almost completely forgotten. You'd be lucky to find his name in a, in a footnote in a psychology history or textbook. Um, but at the, at the time, he was published in major book series and, and journal publications. His reputation was eclipsed in part by the poor reputation of applied psychology at the time, which is a, a major focus of his, and by the rise of behaviorism, which held sway uh, and as a psychological theory. Uh, from the 20s well into the 1950s. He published two major books uh, in psychology in the very prestigious International Library of Psychology, which published books from behaviorists, psychoanalysts, philosophers, and so on. 
um, people like Freud and Watson. Um, one called The Emotions of Normal People, 1928, and a textbook on psychology called Integrative Psychology in 1931. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on things he said in this book as a way of explaining what, what's going on in that strange Wonder Woman comic. Marston believed that psychology should radically reshape our ideas about how the mind works and not just uncritically adopt common sense categories. So, um, as he says here, I submit that the backbone of literature has been transplanted intact into psychology where it has proved pitifully inadequate. What he means is that psychology has taken on these categories from common sense, from literature, uh, to describe things like the emotions um, uncritically, and it's caused uh, a lot of problems. And instead, he appealed to different sources for concepts. He appealed to the fledgling work in neuroscience that was being done in the teens and 20s, 19-teens and 1920s. You see a lot of diagrams of this kind in his books. Um, he appealed to experimental research, um, primarily on physiological uh, measures of emotional responses. Um, this is connected, but not uh, exclusively, uh, his work on the lie detector test. Um, he thought you could use measurements of blood pressure to uh, diagnose various kinds of emotional responses, including deception. And he also had a criterion of emotional normalcy. He thought that you could have normal functional emotions and abnormal dysfunctional emotions, and only the normal ones could be basic. The dysfunctional ones were uh, somehow had to be a product of abnormal psychology. So, and his criteria is something like this. If we follow the analogy of the other biological sciences, we must expect to find normalcy synonymous with maximal efficiency of function, kind of evolutionary criterion. Um, he also said there was a sort of felt side of it or a subjective side of it where normal emotions would be pleasant and harmonious ones. This rules out things like rage and fear as basic parts of the emotional um, economy. Those would have to be dysfunctional uh, relations of com uh, com combined basic emotions. Um, okay. So the, the alternative he lays out is, is heavily based on neuroscientific results. He had what he called the psychonic theory of consciousness, um, which works something like this. Suppose you have, uh, this is a cartoon of two neurons. Um, you have a, a junction between them, right? One is projecting an axon to the, to the other. Um, if you have an ex excitement in one neuron, it'll be passed along uh, to the other electrically. And at the synapse, at the junction between the two, there'll be an electrochemical uh, reaction, which will then excite the subsequent neuron. And this, this junction, we today call it a synapse. Um, Marston's word for it was psychon, because he thought it would be the basic unit of psychology, right? Um, so it's, it's neurology has the neuron, psychology has the psychon. It's kind of a pun, but uh, it's the language he chose to use. And he was not alone in the 1920s in using that kind of vocabulary. Um, any activation across the synapse produces a, a little spark of feeling or consciousness, right? In your perceptual system, it's perceptual consciousness. In your prefrontal cortex, in front of your brain, it's uh, thought. And in your motor synapses, it's emotion, right? So um, mo emotions are a reflection of motor activity. Um, when you have uh, an integration at a neuron between two uh, ex uh, excited states, they're allied signals in some sense, you have pleasant emotion. Um, and when you have some kind of conflicting signals coming, then you have unpleasant emotion or unpleasant feelings. Um, I don't mean to be selling this to you as the latest theory in the emotions. This is uh, Baroque 1920s psychology, but it's it's worth uh, paying attention to, so bear with me. Um, um, so this is an unpleasant feeling. Emotions are a particular kind of feeling uh, where two kinds of signals get integrated. And here I've got three neurons, but this is standing in for large neural systems, of course. Um, when you have 
an integration um, between what Marston calls the motor self and motor stimulus impulses, you have, emo you have emotions. Um, this, is a, this is a little bit strange terminology, but by motor self, he simply means those things going on in your nervous system that do things like keep you in balance, keep your muscles toned, and keep you doing what you were, what you were already doing. So if you're walking to the market, then um, the thing that keeps you walking to the market once you form the plan to do so is your motor self. Motor stimulus is whatever reaction you have to an environmental stimulus that causes you, um, that might cause you to deviate from the motor self. Uh, not necessarily, but in, in some cases. Um, let me remind you of the normal emotions criteria here, pleasantness, harmis, harmony, efficiency of function. Um, he also says they're strength giving. And as I mentioned before, the simplest normal emotions form the foundations for other complex normal and abnormal emotions. Okay. There are four normal emotions um, on Marston's theory. Um, and they all are a com uh, an interaction between the motor stimulus and the motor self. Um, and they can be uh, allied, right? Or they can be in conflict. And alliances are pleasant emotions. Uh, conflicts are uh, somewhat unpleasant, although none of the basic emotions are completely unpleasant. Okay. The first basic emotion is called compliance, right? Compliance is an interaction of the motor self and the motor stimulus, which is opposed, where the motor stimulus overcomes the motor self. Um, so I'm walking along through the woods, and I see a bear, right, uh, threatening me and I choose to stop walking where I was going and run away. That's a form of compliance at the behavioral level. The second is dominance, which is also opposed, but where the motor self prevails, right? So when I manage to, um, say, get away from the bear, um, then I'm reasserting my dominance. If I manage to outrun it, right, then I've dominated the bear in that, in that sense. That's a Again, these are all behavioral characterizations of these emotions. Um, there's inducement, right, where the motor self also prevails, but over a generally allied stimulus. And there is submission, right, where the motor stimulus prevails over the self, um, but not in a way that's fundamentally opposed to the motor self, right. Um, uh, these two are unequivocally pleasant. These there's always a sort of bit of unpleasantness involved. Although the idea is always to get to a point where you reassert the, the self in the appropriate way. Now this, these aren't sort of completely um, digital or discrete categories. In fact, Marston explicitly compares this to the color wheel when he's describing it. And here's, here's a couple of examples of how complex emotions work. Right? As I mentioned before, you might um, engage in compliance in order to reassert dominance. So that's, a, that's a complex relationship. That's a normal, uh, a normal way things go. On the other hand, suppose you are frightened by the bear. You begin to run, or, well, you're surprised by the bear. You begin to run away from the bear, but the bear is clearly catching up to you. And you just sort of panic, fall apart, fall over catatonically, right? because you're just overloaded. Um, that's an extreme version of the abnormal emotion that, that's a sort of overcompliance, uh, which Marston calls fear. Right? So fear is that abnormal relationship. If you successfully run away from the bear um, and uh, you don't freak out uh, uh, in a way that's harmful to you, then that's not, that's not abnormal and that's not what he would call fear. Um, there's some categorical revision going on here. Love can be characterized as a, as a relationship between submission and inducement, right, where um, you sort of go back and forth between the two, um, sort of like this. And um, uh, so, you know, it, if, you, if you're thinking about the relationship to a partner, you, you induce a little bit, then, then the, you, that you submit a little bit. He likes to use examples from child psychology. So... Um, uh, when the mother's holding the baby and stroking the baby, this is, a, this is an example of the baby in, in having the submission emotion, which is very pleasant. And then the mother puts the baby down, and the 
baby wants more attention, so it reaches for the mother, and that's a form of inducement, right? Um, and that's what he calls love. Love is, it can be more passive or more active depending on which of the two factors here is more prominent for the person at the time. It's also the most important emotion to our well-being, right? Because it is a combination of the two pleasant emotions and because it's such a normal relationship. Um, and it's, it's uh, because it's so crucial to a normal, healthy, psycho-emotional life um, uh, is why it's sort of the center, the culmination of his theory. It's, in his theory, it's emphatically not a reciprocal, symmetrical relationship. In order to have love, you've got one person more on the submitting side and one person more on the inducement side. You might go back and forth. Um, but love requires a, a, a love leader. And it requires love leadership. And it's an interesting feature of his theory that um, love leadership is not equally distributed among the sexes. So here's a Father's Day present for everybody. Um, male love leadership is virtually impossible. A man's body is not designed for active love and does not therefore keep him sufficiently love stimulated to control his overly developed appetite. And Marston draws this conclusion from uh, behavioral data and from um, his understanding of, the, of uh, the hormonal system associated with love, um, which, again, relatively primitive in the 1920s. Because of this conclusion, he ends the book, The Emotions of Normal People, with this chapter heading, Emotional Reeducation, okay. um, in which he lays out a social program of reform and education which is meant to make everybody psychologically healthy. In our society, because of the kinds of relationships that people have um, and the way things are run, uh, society is pretty, pretty much dysfunctional. And um, he's laying out a program to, uh, to fix it. And in this program, women must be emotionally re-educated to serve as love leaders. This involves giving them the right kind of psychological understanding to, to do so teaching them the theory here, probably, um, and also making them able to support themselves, right, and giving them the practical knowledge to do so. And, and then men and women both must be re-educated to submit to proper love leaders at the proper time. Everybody has to have a love leader in their life in order to be healthy, and they have to, they have to engage in the submission, too. And it doesn't have to be a sexual thing, right? It can be, it's, this is an emotional, this is an emotional issue. Okay. So what I want to say in order to explain what's going on in the Wonder Woman comics is that Wonder Woman is actually an application of this psychological theory, just as the lie detector is an application of other parts of his psychology. Um, and in fact, uh, he says in a letter uh, which has been dug up. Um, frankly, Wonder Woman is psychological propaganda for the new type of woman who should, I believe, rule the world. There isn't enough in this male organism to run the planet peacefully. And uh, as a historical point, the way he got involved in writing comic books, it's not usual for a, a clinically trained, uh, Harvard trained psychologist to be writing comic books, um, is that he uh, he wrote a lot of popular magazine articles because he thought the, he thought the importance of this emotional re-education program, uh, he, had to, he, he really had to devote an, a big part of his time to it. And he wrote a big critique of comic books, which he thought were these sort of hyper-masculinist role models and full of sexism and, and uh, domination and all kinds of unpleasant things. Um, and so he wrote, the, he wrote this critique, which he said, this is a really powerful medium. You've got a million people out there reading comic books, supposedly, um, or more. I think, in, fact, in fact, I think the title of his article is um, Why 100 Million Americans Read Comic Books, which seems like an overestimation. But um, uh, he, he wrote this critique, and the comic company um, decided the, the right way to answer this was to hire him as a consultant to make the, the comics better because he was a relatively important commentator on these things. And um, he proposed the, the comic book and they said, we'll, we'll create it if you write it. So let me just, in order to sum up, um, what you've got here is uh, 
in Marston's career trajectory, you have the, the critique of current psychology as being unscientific in its basis, the attempt to replace it with a more scientific theory of the emotions, which leads him to a kind of social educational program motivated um, primarily by psychological well-being, which then turns out to be support for um, radical feminist values that he then attempts to uh, use popular culture to propagate. And he, he didn't only do Wonder Woman, he wrote some novels and lots of pop psychology textbooks and magazine articles and all manner of things. So let me just end with a few, more, a few examples where you can perhaps see this, these kinds of psychological ideas working themselves out. Here's one of the, um, one of the Amazons, uh, and this is Aphrodite, the goddess of the Amazons. Um, and she's charging, uh, she's charging this woman with the, the job of changing the character of men to make them serve their fellow humans. And you've got this bit I showed you before about the pleasure of submission to a, a, a good mistress, not an evil mistress, or a master, period. Don't submit to a master. Um, you see themes like that all the, all the time. Um, uh, Elva here's begging for uh, the opportunity to submit. This explains the bondage games uh, that we mentioned before. This also, there's a lot of this talk about um, uh, submitting to a cruel husband's domination ruined my life. You know, most, in fact, if you look at, from about 1941 to about 1947, the, 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 the motivation or the, the thing that creates the dramatic tension in something like 60 or 70 percent of the stories is a cruel man's domination of some uh, unwitting woman. And in this story, I told you, there's all these little bits of that idea, right? Um, you have to make him think of your, you as his queen instead of his slave. You must control him. Um, uh, he rebels bitterly against feminine control. That's in the, text, in the psychology textbook that that would be the first reaction, given our culture. Um, but in fact, it is the final test of manhood. Right? And it is pleasurable, right? He comes to enjoy it, uh, as, as we said. Um, um, uh, now, and then, of course, the problem comes along when she reverts to a form of submission. Um, and this causes all of, the, all of the dramatic tension in the story. Um, OK, so that's, uh, that's my, my tale, my attempt to explain how uh, Wonder Woman has a scientific origin, right? Um, uh, uh, um, uh, so that's, I guess, where I'll stop. And let me just plug again the Center for Values, which has a website, values.utdallas.edu, um, which might be of interest. So thank you for having me. Now, I, I, I do have a question. Yes. Now, was Marzen um, had an interesting personal life, right? I mean, he did. He, did. he actually lived in a long-term relationship with, with two women? He did, yeah. He was, uh, he was, uh, uh, let me just go back to my slide. Um, uh, I, s I snuck this in. Yeah, so that's Marston. Um, this is uh, his first wife, Elizabeth Marston, Elizabeth Hollowell is the original name. This is his other wife, Olive Byrne. And uh, I forget which children are which, but um, this is, I know this is Olive, named after Olive, but her daughter. And uh, these are the other two children. Two belong to her. Um, it was a very, and, and uh, um, very interesting, not, not uh, didn't keep it a particular secret, uh, uh, the co editors of DC Comics knew all about it. And the two of them, he died young. He died in 1947. And they lived together until Olive died in the 1980s, um, raised the children together and, and so forth. And actually through parts of the Great Depression, um, Elizabeth supported the family. Uh, the, the, the breadwinner. Yeah. He was a very interesting character. Yeah, reading. definitely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Huh? Is well, he was, he was officially married to Elizabeth, but they all lived together. And yeah. Children yeah. Them, so. Lifelong menage. Lifelong polygamous. Yeah. All right.
Thank you very much. Okay. We've got the companion again. <laughs> Can I just call you the faithless? <laughs> call us the remnant of the companions. tried this out, what was it, a couple of months ago? Scott, do you remember? Three or four months ago, I was working on a song, and uh, I think it might be done, so we're going to try it again. I should have my music with me, but I'll do the fourth verse.
Okay, I'd like to invite Dr. Zachary Moore up to the front. Um, so I just want to take a few minutes um, to remember Kumar. Um, for those of you that, that were not aware of this, um, he passed away last Tuesday. He actually, um, from, from what we've heard from his roommates, he I came home after work and was in a really great mood and decided that he was going to go swimming in their apartment pool. And um, he drowned um, just suddenly, unexpectedly. It's, it's a very random thing. Um, and it, um, it, it can be hard to um, approach death. I mean, I, I think death is the sort of the ultimate test of humanity. It's one of the, the things that really defines who we are, um, how we approach it, and how we, how we deal with it. Um, you know, we can sing songs about it. We can make jokes about it. Um, but in the end, it's coming for all of us, and we, we don't know the hour or the day um, it can come. Um, with a lot of buildup, or it can come out of nowhere just randomly. And so, um, just as a way of saying goodbye to Kumar, he was he was only with us for in this group for you know a matter of months really. Um, but he he really brightened up um, just about anything he was a part of. And he was um, I'll just show, I have some pictures to show. This was um, I think Larry took this picture of him at um, one of the social outings, one of the first social outings he came at. And that was pretty much Kumar most of the time with a big smile and um, at least one drink in his hand. <laughs> um, he was a really great guy. I, I didn't know him as well as I would have liked. He was always um, friendly, helpful, um, helped me move into my new house, in fact, just several weeks back. Um, and um, helped us here at the fellowship with some of our charitable outreaches. You know, he was active in uh, the AIDS supper, the monthly AIDS supper at the Ewing Center. Um, made great food, made really spicy Indian food, and he would bring it to the potluck, and um, it was really, really great. He loved having fun. He loved spending time with his friends, and um, can't, I mean, I, I know it's kind of a cliche, but I can't think of a single negative thing to say about the guy. Um, and I'd like to open it up to anybody else who'd like to um, to share uh, some thoughts as we remember Kumar. Um, and I'll, I'll just point out real quick that uh, we are collecting for a couple memorial tributes in his name. Um, Kumar was very active with the SPCA of Texas, very, very active. And so we'd like to make a, a gift to the SPCA in his name um, and also a gift to the Ewing Center where he spent a lot of time um, with us um, you know, helping his fellow humans um, whenever he could. So um, those I, the PayPal links for those donations are on the website, so you can find them there. You can just talk to one of us. But does anybody else would like to remember Kumar? Hi, um, I'm Luke. I didn't really plan on coming up here, but I just thought I'd share a couple of memories I have of Kumar, um, two brief reminiscences. I only met Kumar New Year's Eve at a party, actually, um, and he was there drinking his dirty martinis and uh, the, trying to get everyone to dance, um, which, if you know some of our friends, they're not too... Uh, too likely to do that, but um, he kept pushing, and music was playing, and we were just there in the kitchen dancing around. Um, he can be very persuasive. Uh, and uh, not two months later, around Oscar season, I threw a party um, and made kind of a contest to see who could predict the number of correct winners for the Oscars, and Kumar took this very seriously. Um, he is a big, big, or he, he was a big movie fan. Um, he, so therefore, he went out and saw the, some 20 odd nominated movies. Um, and uh, he, he was kind of mad that um, someone who shall remain nameless just went to a website and looked up what the critics said who would win, and they ended up winning. So he was mad. But um, he, when he, puts his, he put his mind to things, he did things, and uh, he was full of life, and I'll miss him. Uh, 
Hi, I'm, I'm Jeff. Uh, Kumar and I uh, spent a lot of time together. Uh, I would like drive him around to places. We would carpool. Um, he wasn't all that good with directions. He actually had a, a GPS in his car, but he said sometimes even with the GPS, he would get a little lost going to new places. So I ended up sort of driving a lot and we went to a lot of things together. So, uh, when, but the thing I remember most about him that really sticks in my mind, he had this, this way of talking about things that he really enjoyed. He would say, that's so good. He just put such an emphasis on, it's so good. Even just remembering like the foods that he enjoyed when he was a kid or uh, playing with, with pets, he really loved. Uh, dogs and just you could sort of see in his face when he said something was so good that just thinking about it sort of lit up his face so um, I'm really gonna miss him and Kumar is gonna be my, my so good memory As, as free thinkers, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't consider the possibility of an afterlife. Uh, there's no evidence for that, um, and so a lot of a lot of people, a lot of religious people, I think, um, use that as a way of giving meaning to something that happens to us that is utterly meaningless, and, and every death is is meaningless. And, um, but I think that it allows us getting rid of that concept of the afterlife allows us to, to turn around and say, you know what, the, the death may be meaningless, but the life has meaning. And I think clearly Kumar's life had meaning, special meaning for, for many of us here. And, um, so I'll, I'll miss him as well. Okay, um, I think we're about ready for the kids. Are they on deck? Did I bring? No, I did not bring a copy of. <laughs> They're just floating around. Jason, would you like to say something? About... No, that's okay. Yeah, okay. I, I buy one people would You know what? Given that, so, you know, everyone gets. I got looked at funny. <laughs> the neighborhood I live in, so, yeah. I, I, I can't do it. I just. It's shameful. I can't do it. <laughs> huh? No. <laughs> they are coming. Okay. All right. So <laughs> yes, um, what we are looking at doing, um, the the diversity council did again relaunch. And one of the things that we are looking at doing is uh, really our first real event is the, um, the Pride Parade coming up in September. So we are trying to get some, <laughs> he's got it. Speaking uh, of which. <laughs> we are trying to collect some money for Ebony new. Magazine yes. Features the chair of the Diversity Council in a uh, profile article. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are collecting money for the banner and the application. It's about $250 application for the, uh, the Pride Parade. And then, of course, we've got the Diversity Council banner that we're looking at walking under. So, okay, we do have children. Okay, excellent. Yeah, kind of. Just make it ice cream. They didn't want to come. They're making what? Make it ice cream. Hi, everyone. Oh, a small group today. Um, well, today with the little kids, we enjoyed actually having a park next door. So we went out and played a little bit, and then we came inside and made ice cream. That's why you don't see very many of them right now, because they're eating ice cream. Um, we did learn, we were able to discuss, it's a really great experiment, because it's nice and simple, 
So you can do it with little kids, and then with bigger kids, you can kind of get into how it works better. But with the little ones, they learn, they were like, eh, it just tastes like milk, not ice cream. We're like, oh, let's add more vanilla. So they kind of learn how you alter recipes after it's made and stuff like that. And the older kids are actually making their ice cream right now. That's why they're not in here. They're like, I mean ice cream. <laughs> they talked about um, earlier women's suffrage and voting rights, kind of trying to meld in with what y'all were talking about a little bit. Not so Wonder Woman-ish, but kind of still in the same feminism field. Um, so hopefully if you catch one of them at Pollock, you can kind of delve out a little bit of what they were actually doing. Do you have anything you want to say? No? Okay, she's just going to stand and look pretty. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And with that, I'd like to close it out. Thank you all for coming. And we'll go ahead and uh, adjourn to the potluck.